Welcome to Enrich Your Life with Humor with John Kendi. On this tape, we'll look at how humor enriches our lives and how we need to live and enjoy the present moment to get the most out of life. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was a December night. It was raining. A lot like tonight. He was on a bus leaving Fresno, heading to Bakersfield. He could hear the wind and the rain pounding against the window of the bus. It had been a terrible week. His wife had threatened to shoot him. He had had enough and just decided, I'm leaving town. And he left with nothing but the clothes on his back, stopped at a friend's house, borrowed a little bit of money, hit the road looking for work. Traveling down the central part of California, got to Bakersfield on Christmas Eve. Not a good time to look for work. A lot of the places were having Christmas parties. A lot of places were closed. Spent that night, Christmas Eve, in the Greyhound bus depot. And at midnight, the dispatcher came over the PA system and sang Silent Night. In a strange town, with no friends in town, no house in town, no car, no bank account, 37 cents in his pocket, an attache case with some toilet items that had been purchased at a drugstore in the attache case at Goodwill and some day old rolls, a half a pack that was bought at a thrift store, a bakery thrift store. The next day was Christmas Day. He made a collect call to Missouri. I was living in Missouri at the time and he called me and family and friends had no clue where he was. And he told me his predicament didn't have any money and the next day I went to Western Union and wired money to my father age 55 starting over with literally nothing shortly after that he had a heart attack quadruple bypass surgery quite a way to start your life over I need for you to know three things first of all Last year, we celebrated his 76th birthday. Been living in Bakersfield ever since. How about that? Secondly, that crazy woman was not my mother. <laughs> it was his second wife. And thirdly, he's got a great life today. He has a wonderful wife, a nice house, he travels, he drives a Cadillac, and he's retired. Things happen to us in life, and it depends upon what we do about it and how we think. Everything in life is how you look at it. It's not what happens to you. It's how you look at things in life. My dad's a Norwegian, full-blooded Norwegian. He grew up speaking Norwegian. If I asked you to make a list of Norwegian humorists and comedians... <laughs> big list? <laughs> Anybody on the list, huh? And as I grew, grew up, I don't remember my dad telling lots of jokes, but he was always one of the first to laugh at jokes. And lately, he even uh, is creating some of his own jokes. He was in a grocery store line, and the line was moving really slowly. And he turned around to the woman behind me, and he said, I hate these fast-moving lines. <laughs> they stir up so much dust. That's Norwegian humor. <laughs> a sense of humor is not telling jokes. A sense of humor is a way of looking at life. A way of looking at life. It isn't very often my dad gets to hear me speak. It's been about four years, I think, since he heard me do a talk, and he happens to be here tonight. And he is from Bakersfield, and would you just stand and just wave to the folks? I'd like them to meet you. I'm glad you're here, and we need role models in our life that show us that if we can make it through things and that life is good. And uh, I have to thank my dad for basically showing me how to live. So it's, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Boy, it's so great to laugh, isn't it? How many people think life should be fun? How many people think the purpose of life is to suffer? <laughs> One person in the back. That's why she's not sitting down. <laughs> Easier to suffer when you're standing up. 
Do you know anybody like that? People who always look at the negative side and the sour side of life? No matter what happens, when opportunity knocks, they complain about the noise. Those people make themselves miserable, but how about the people around them, huh? Isn't it contagious? Laughter is contagious, and isn't the negative side of life contagious as well? We need to find the humor in life. And as I speak around the country, people share with me how they use humor in their life to relieve stress. I did a program at the Iowa School for the Deaf, and a deaf student came up and he said, John, he said, deaf people have problems that hearing people don't have. I was out having dinner with my girlfriend. We were sitting at the table, and it seemed like everyone in the restaurant was staring at us. It was really starting to bug me. So I told my girlfriend, I said, watch this. And I stood up from the table, and I walked over to the wall where there was a pay telephone. I took the handset off the hook, placed it on the ledge, put in 20 cents. I dialed my number, and I started to sign into the telephone. <laughs> And then I slowly turned my head. And it seemed like everyone in the room was watching me in silence. And then I smiled and everybody burst into laughter. <laughs> he, had a, he had a tense situation and he chose to use humor to relieve the stress. He might have reacted differently. He might have sat there and just fussed and fumed all night long. And instead, he told people, yes, we're different from you. That in many ways, we're just the same. We've got a sense of humor. We can laugh at ourselves. And we're okay. He used humor to relieve stress in his life. We can all do that. It's a natural stress reliever. I read for many years that soldiers in a foxhole, if a bomb goes off nearby, when the dust settles, they break out laughing when they realize they're unharmed. And I never understood that until I was on a freeway in San Diego. The roads were wet. 50 miles an hour, it was a rush hour. Two women driving in the car in front of me. Somebody cut into their car, and the woman driving swerved her wheel, and her car spun totally around three and a half times. Never left her lane, never hit another car. The entire freeway came to a dead stop. They were facing the wrong direction. We were hood to hood. And I looked both of them right in the eyes, and they cracked up. They just started laughing uncontrollably. They were probably thinking, people are going to think we're nuts. <laughs> but it was nature's way of relieving the stress. They didn't know it. They probably didn't even understand what was happening. It was nature's way of relieving all of that tension. When you laugh, your muscles relax whether you want them to or not. It's just the way it is. Have you ever carried a box or a mattress or a couch up a flight of stairs with somebody and you start to laugh? You have to drop it, don't you? You just you can't maintain muscle tension. Have you ever laughed so hard you had more muscles relaxed than you had planned on? <laughs> we won't ask for a show of hands, okay? <laughs> but it's always uh, something we can use in our life to relieve stress. We make choices in our life. And for example, if we come home from work and we've had a tough day at work, and we come in and we, our significant other is there, and we say, Hi, honey, oh, I had a tough, tough day at work today. I need to sit down and just, oh, I need to just relax a bit. Let me turn on the TV and see if there's any civil wars to watch or any murders or trials. I just need to relax a little, you know? Isn't that what we do? We sit down and we watch all of this stuff on the news. I recommend don't watch the news if you're feeling stressed out. If you've, got to, if you've got to get your daily dose of news, read it in the National Enquirer. <laughs> Best way to get it. Or you can have some toys. It's a megaphone. And it's fun to play with. It magnifies your voice. But it also changes your voice. Like so. <laughs> it's a little thing with crazy and silly things. So, if you want one of these things, you can do lots of crazy things with it. Little megaphone. Toy stores are wonderful. This looks like a radar detector, but it's not. It has, uh, if someone cuts you off on the freeway, for example, instead of getting upset, <laughs> or your Star Wars phasers, 
Or if you're working on the telephone, either at home or at work, you have your office at home and, and you can't get some, somebody's just long-winded, you can't get them off the phone. I gotta go, I got another call coming in, sorry. Anybody wanna buy one of these? <laughs> Toys, great. They help relieve our stress. Humor helps to shape our attitude. Helps to shape our attitude. A black man came up to me. His name was Al. And he said, John, he said, explain something to me. He said, black people, when they're born, they're black. When they're hot, they're black. When they're cold, they're black. And when they're dead, they're black. But white people, when they're born, they're pink. <laughs> When they're hot, they're red. And when they're cold, they're white. When they're dead, they're blue. <laughs> and they call us colored. <laughs> and he said, John, he said, look at my hand. And he held his hand next to his shoe. He said, my hand's not black. It's brown. It's dark brown. What? He said, look at your hand. He held it next to a white sheet of paper. Your hand's not white. It's brown. It's light brown. Which is different shades. The same color. He used humor to shape his perspective on the subject of color, race, prejudice. He chose to focus not on how we were different, but on how we were the same. And isn't it true? For every one way we're different from someone, there's a hundred ways that we're exactly the same. Humor helps to shape perspective. I had a certain perspective about my car. I had an Audi. You know how it is when you get a new car? And you go over to the mall, you know where you park it way out on the end so no one bumps their big doors into it? The Audis had some bad press too that they ran out of control in parking lots and that sort of thing. But it was a wonderful car. That was bad press that was unwarranted. I went down to Studio City in Los Angeles. I parked out behind the hotel where it was safe. I went up, I went to bed. The next morning I came down to the workshop. I went out behind the hotel to get into the conference center. I noticed that my door was open. It was locked the night before. And as I walked up to my car, I noticed through the open door I could see where my stereo used to be. There were two wires hanging out. And I walked up and I slammed my door. And Find out why it was open, it wouldn't stay shut. And then I realized what had happened on my beautiful, smooth door. Somebody had taken a hammer and driven a screwdriver through the side of it and bent the door handle up so they could open the door and take my stereo. I thought, oh, I should have left the keys in the car. They had tried to steal it and it would have gone out of control in the parking lot. <laughs> And my second thought was, how could this happen? I had a club on the steering wheel. Maybe I should have used it on their head. And then I thought, well, I could have gotten all upset. I could have fussed and fumed. And you know what? It wouldn't have changed a thing. Except my ulcers and my high blood pressure. Wouldn't it? my radio would be gone? It still would have cost two hundred and forty-two dollars to get the radio or to get the door fixed. And I went down to the stereo place down here. It took them two hours to put my stereo in. They should have hired those guys in L.A. <laughs> I know they didn't spend two hours in my car. <laughs> they were in and out of there in ninety seconds, and they were pro they were professional. They didn't damage the dash. They unplugged the radio. I was ripped off by professional. How lucky. They didn't steal my garage door opener, my micro cassette recorder, my $200 jacket in the back seat. I had a leather jacket in the back seat. And you know what? I had a weekend planned and I was going to the Magic Castle that night and they weren't going to steal my weekend. See, it's a choice how we react to things. And if I had reacted negatively, it wouldn't have done a thing except messed me up. So it's all on how we look at things. Traveling is a hassle sometimes, though. I know it is. I was going up to an engagement north of San Francisco. I got a flat tire in my car, and I considered a little problem, like a BB, hard as steel, but when it's on your car, and all your stuff's in the trunk, and you're in a hurry, and you have deadlines to meet, a problem. 
to deal with. About four months later, I was heading up, went through King City again. I, I got the first flat tire in King City. I think I picked up another nail in King City. I'm not sure because the tire didn't go flat until I was on the approach ramp to the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. And I always wondered what it would be like to change my tire on the bridge. I fixed that tire with traffic going by. A problem. Bigger. I was driving in a truck in Missouri. We left an Air Force base, went down a deserted country road in the middle of the night and without warning drove into an area of road that was flash flooded. Water went up both directions. The engine stalled. Turned out the lights. Ahead of me and behind me, I could see nothing but water and branches floating by. I knew no one would be by till morning and the car wouldn't start. A problem. Bigger. Heavier. And there was a woman who was riding on a train in Alabama not too long ago. She wanted to be comfortable. It was about 3 in the morning. She kicked her shoes off to feel a little bit better. And then without warning, her coach plunged into a 20-foot deep swamp. She climbed out the window. She said it was a little bit like climbing up a waterfall. And then she swam through a swamp that was warm, slimy, and infested with snakes. A problem. Bigger, heavier, darker. And I had a flat tire. Sometimes, don't we have a tendency to turn our molehills into mountains in our imagination? To turn our BBs into bowling balls up here? And we're capable, the amazing thing is we're capable of dealing with bowling ball sized problems. People who have been through traumatic things, prisoner of war camps, you name it. They say afterwards, people say, wow, you're heroes, it's remarkable. And they say, oh no, we just, we just did what anybody else would have. That's what they say. That's inside of us, but it depends upon what's up here that gets us through that. You may have heard of John Thompson, the farm boy in North Dakota. I won't go at length about his story, but he lost both of his arms in a farming accident several years ago, two or three years ago, I believe. And he was home alone in the dead of winter, and he saved himself. He called for help. There was no one home. They reattached his arms. Well, you need to have some stuff up here to get through something like that. I talked with John about four months after the accident. I said, how you doing? He says, doing pretty good. He said, originally they were hoping I'd get some use of my arms down to the elbows. And I already do. And now they're hoping I'll get some use of my hands eventually. He said, how's your sense of humor? He said, it's better now than it was before the accident. And his girlfriend said, John makes people laugh. It's fun to be around. The ambulance driver said, he had it together. He told us what to do. There were volunteer ambulance drivers. He saved the day. The power of the mind under bowling ball conditions. Think we can handle the BBs in our life? Think we can handle the everyday, everyday stresses? We're capable of doing that. In the middle of the crisis, he was laying in the bathtub. He was waiting for help, waiting for his aunt. He waited 30 minutes before his aunt showed up. She came in and she said, the ambulance will be here in just a second. And John looked up and said, 1001. A little bit of humor to relieve the stress. Isn't that amazing? And I saw him on the Phil Donahue show not long ago, maybe four or five months ago, and he was sitting there with his arms crossed in front of him. Phil said, well, how are you doing? How are your arms? He raised both of his arms, bent his elbows, and made two fists. The power of the mind and what the mind can do. And it's always a choice in our life to have the positive attitudes. I'm going to recommend that you can shape your attitudes through, through humor and something called reframing and neuro-linguistic programming. Sometimes 
Well, winning the stress in the attitude game is a matter of what's up here. So if we can put a different picture frame around something and look at it differently, we'll, we'll feel differently. Let me give you an example. There's a rule of thumb that 2% of the people on this earth are placed here for the purpose of irritating you. <laughs> 2%. Seems, seems like more sometimes. It's two, two percent. So if you've got somebody and they're bugging you, maybe you have to work at work and it's a, it's a client or it's a vendor or it's a customer, and someone's really getting to you, you remember, just remember, hey, huh, they're just doing their job. And you might say to them, or better yet, think to yourself, you're doing a great job. And it's, it's just a little gimmick. It's a way of reframing things. And to help, it helps to keep you from transferring some of the irritation you might feel to someone else. Reframing and using humor. Taking care of what's up here. Because we have a filter. It's called the reticular cortex, reticular activating system. And we filter things out in our life. And what we need to do is to be able to tune in to the humor in life. Sometimes it happens and it just flies right on by. I bought a red Honda. And the strangest thing, once I bought that red Honda, there were all kinds, all kinds of other people were buying red Hondas. I saw them all the time. On, I never saw them before. You know the feeling? You're tuned in to see something or you're not. It's the same with humor. You're driving down the road. Take the average person driving down the freeway and there's some beautiful wildflowers and there's some fluffy white clouds and you might even be heading down south past the ocean and there's some beautiful waves. Lots of times, no one notices those. Do people slow down to look at the wildflowers? Or slow down to look at the clouds? They're thinking of what's going on at work, what's going on at home, what am I going to be shopping for? And then they pass an accident. Do they slow down to look at the accident? <laughs> what are our habits? What are we tuned into? And we need to be aware of that because sometimes we can tune into the negative things in life and not the positive things in life to shape our attitudes. I went to uh, Orlando, Florida, and uh, we had a family reunion there, both my brothers and all of their kids, and went to Disney World, and we were leaving and went to the airport and got the dolly out of the car and loaded all the suitcases onto it, and we were starting to go down the hallway, and. There's the physics of a dolly. You know, if you've got a lot of stuff on it, you have to lower the handle to get the balance right, you understand? Because if it's too high, it, you can't pull it because it, it tips over you know, the wrong way. So the handle was really low and it was sort of awkward, but my mother is five foot three. And she said, no problem. She's in good shape, takes care of herself. She says, I'll pull the luggage. So it was just right for her. She was able to walk along like this. So we were walking down the hall and I thought, what a funny picture this is. <laughs> I'm six foot three. On the other side of my mom was Michael. He's six foot four. My mother is 70 years old, five foot three, and she's carrying all the luggage. <laughs> and we're just walking along. <laughs> and I commented on that, and we stopped in the hall, and we just laughed and laughed and laughed. That's something to do with what we filter out. If, we're, if, we're, if I'm worried about getting on the plane or that I may have forgotten my tickets or they may lose my baggage, I wouldn't even have been aware of what was happening at the time. It's a matter, do we filter things out? I was heading from Montgomery, Alabama in the car to Atlanta, Georgia. Beautiful drive. I stopped at a truck stop, sort of cafe. And the waitress came over and we had the menus and I looked in there and it said, soup du jour. Didn't tell me what it was. So I asked the waitress, I said, uh, what's, what's the soup du jour? Now, I don't have really high expectations. I wasn't expecting her to say, oh, oui, monsieur, c'est un potage français, très délicieux. I wasn't expecting an answer in French, for example. I was expecting an answer something like, beans and ham, something simple. But no, she just was there, she was chewing her gum. I said, what's the soup du jour? And she said, oh, that's the soup of the day. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, what a dumb answer. 
But then as I got in the car later and I was driving on, on my trip, I thought, you know what? She looked me up and down and she thought I needed that information. <laughs> the joke was on me. Do we filter it out or do we see it? And can we laugh at ourselves sometimes? That's so important to shaping our attitudes. It also helps us with creativity because humor is looking at things. It's how we look at things. There was a construction crew on a high-rise construction project. They were five stories above the ground. Have you ever seen the steel walkers walking the steel beams? Five stories down, smooth, frozen cement. Minneapolis. Winter. The wind is blowing. You can see their breath. Next door is a completed office building. The office workers are having a coffee break. They're watching the construction crew outside. One of the office workers says, I'm going to send those construction folks a message. Took out a big sheet of paper. Made a message. Held it up. In here, it's 72 degrees. The construction crew saw that. It was cold outside. One of the construction folks says, I'll send the office workers a message of my own. Took out a big sheet of cardboard. Made his message. Held it up. Out here, it's $35 an hour. <laughs> he had a choice when he saw the first sign. Do you see how he might have reacted differently? Maybe with a gesture? I don't know. Might have, might have waved or something. Instead, he chose what I call the creative response. A little bit of humor. And I call it the creative response because humor's relationships is how things are related and not related. He was relating working conditions and wages. See how obvious that is? Just making an observation of what's obvious is sometimes lighthearted. Gary Larson cartoons. He is relating more than anything else animals to human characteristics. A car driving down the road, a bull driving the car. Next to the bull is a cow. In the back seat is a calf. We're driving past a field with human beings standing in the field. Now the picture is funny all, all by itself. And the calf sticks his head out the window and goes, yakety yakety yak. <laughs> he, just, he just twists things around. That's important. Think of somebody you know with a great sense of humor. Aren't they always seeing things just a little bit differently from everybody else? And when it comes time to solve problems, to be creative, isn't that what's essential? To be able to see things a little bit differently and not be focused in on the same old... You're at a staff meeting and you're implementing something new and someone says, we need to do it this way and someone else says, no, 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 no. We've got to do it this way because this is the way we've... You've heard that before. And we all know that's not necessarily the best way to do something. And humor and creativity helps us see different options. It's so important that we do that. It helps to build relationships and teamwork as well. Humor does. Little kids laugh 300 times a day. Adults laugh, on the average, 15 times a day. You'll, you'll be familiar with some of the slogans that we hear as we grow up that change us from 300 to 15 laughs a day. Things like, Will you grow up? Will you act your age? Oh, stop kidding around. And it just drums out the creativity and the humor and the fun in us. Tom Peters says, you can assess the health of an organization by the amount of laughter in it. And he also says, if your job isn't fun, you're wasting your life. You've got to have fun at work. You've got to find the fun at work or find a different job, maybe. And the fun is there to be found if you develop the discipline to see the humor, develop the humor habit. I wondered if politicians, considering the politicians are leaders, do you suppose there's an, a, a connection between the success of a politician and their ability to use humor? I had some humor workshops and I asked people, rank the last eight presidents in their ability to use humor. Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton. 
Best at humor, who do you think? Reagan, good guess, who else? Kennedy, everybody always says Reagan and Kennedy. It came out, Kennedy was one, Reagan was two, almost tied. Way behind in the last place, where does everybody go? Nixon was on the bottom. There's a book out called The Kennedy Wit. I'm still looking for a book called The Nixon Wit. Most popular, most successful. Who's on top? Kennedy. Reagan, yeah. Generally popular. Kennedy, Reagan, everybody else was down near the bottom again. Coincidence? Do you suppose there's a connection? That humor helped them handle stress? Humor helped them uh, help their charisma? Handle tough questions at news conferences? I'm convinced that Reagan used it naturally. Remember when he was shot? And they whisked him into the hospital and he looked and he saw Nancy and he said, Honey, I forgot to duck. <laughs> old, old Western movies? Borrowed a line. He was lying on the operating table. He looked up at the doctors. He said, I hope you guys are Republican. A nurse was taking care of him. There, there are sometimes uncomfortable situations in hospitals. A nurse had been taking care of various needs that he had. and He wrote a note and handed it to the nurse. And the note said, Does Nancy know about us? <laughs> he used it against the debate with Mondale. In the second campaign, the age issue kept coming up. Mondale brought it up. And Reagan said, I will not make age an issue in this campaign. I will not exploit for political purposes my opponents in youth and inexperience. <laughs> he just turned it around and age was no longer an issue. Patty Davis was interviewed on one of the talk shows recently. She said the Reagans, when they have tough problems going on, they just laugh. And I thought, boy, that would make a good bumper sticker when the going gets tough. Tough, start laughing. It's a good way to deal with difficult things. It's not that you can laugh your problems away. It's that if you see the humor, it changes what's up here, and then you can deal with the problem. How about quail and gore? Good at using humor? Good targets, huh? I was thinking, I would like to see both of them use some humor. It is a good way to diffuse attacks. Bob Orban with Gerald Ford's head speech writer. He said if Reagan was, had been caught in Watergate, he would have used humor to survive it. The power of humor. Quail. Potato. Murphy Brown. I saw him use humor in two places. And I thought, hey, wow, that's what he did. He was talking to a group. He said, sometimes I envy Murphy Brown. This is during the campaign. At least she knows she's coming back next year. Not bad. And then he was at the Republican National Convention. He said, those Democrats say they're moderates. If they're moderates, I'm a world champion speller. A little bit of humor, and it diffuses the attacks that were coming. Al Gore was on the David Letterman show. He opened with an Al Gore joke. You know generally what the Al Gore jokes are about. His first line was, he asked Letterman, he says, how do you tell a Secret Service agent from the Vice President? He said, the Secret Service agent is the one with a personality. <laughs> a little bit of humor, a little bit of humor. And by using humor in the workplace, it helps us to, to build some of the bonds and the esprit and keep things together and keep things moving on. Humor belongs in the workplace. I might ask you, does anybody have a job description where they work? A few people. A lot of people don't. It'd be nice to sort of create your own job description. I'm wondering, does anybody have having a good time or putting humor into their life in their job description? One person. That's good. There are some major corporations that have it in their mission statement. And I would suggest to you that you might look at that in your job, have it in your job description, so that you do something on purpose to add fun in the work environment for other people and for yourself. It's critical that you do that. It's always a choice that we have in our life. I want to share a poem with you. It's called An Autobiography in Five Chapters by Portia Nelson. Chapter 1. 
I walked down the street. There was a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fell in. I was lost. I was helpless. It took me a long time to get out. Chapter 2. I walked down the same street. There was a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretended I didn't see it. I fell in again. I can't believe I'm in this same place. It wasn't my fault. It still took me a long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walked down the same street. There was a deep hole in the sidewalk. I saw it was there. I fell in again. This is my job. But you know, it was my fault. And I knew where I was. And I got out right away. Chapter 4. I walked down the same street. There was a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walked around it. Chapter 5. I walked down a different street. I thought, wow, simple poem, but isn't it just like real life? Don't we all have holes in our sidewalks at home? Little pitfalls, little stumbling blocks. Every day we make choices to see them. Do you ever ignore, ignore, ignore a problem? To walk around it? To fall right in the middle of the problem? To walk down a different street? Anybody ever walk down a different street sometime in your life besides my dad? You know, a lot of us have, have done that at times. And we make those choices, and we have to be aware of that because it's our choices that affect what's up here. People think that burnout is having too much stuff. Too many jobs, too many deadlines, too many bosses, too many rules, too many regulations. Burnout is not having enough stuff. Burnout is not having enough fun, energy, enthusiasm, motivation. Concentration. When you have all of those things, you can deal with the pressures. Who creates your fun? You do. Who creates your enthusiasm? Who creates your motivation? You do. Everything that matters in life the most, we're the masters. We create. And McGee Cooper calls burnout joy salvation. That's what it is. It's the lack of joy in our life, and by adding the humor habit into our life, it will make a difference. I'm going to ask you a question. Where are you right now? Where are you today? Where are you right now? Do you ever find yourself living in the past? Living in the future? That ever happened? For, let's say you went to a movie. You went to a movie last week, and it was a bad movie. And you got up and walked out in the middle of the movie. Well, this week I come over here and, and I see I see Brian and I say, Hey, Brian, let me let me tell you about this bad movie I saw last week. Would you come with me? I want to watch it again. Let's go, let's come on, let's go watch it again. I want to, I'd really like to relive it. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? But how about real life? Well, Brian, last week. You wouldn't believe what she said to me. I mean, this really got to me. Let me tell you, let me tell you, let me relive it. Let me tell you about this. I had this problem with this person, and it was bad, and I just want to relive the old movie again. Did we ever live in the past? Rehashing old problems over and over. Martin Seligman of Learned Optimism says, Rumination, which is the mulling over and over and over of things, combined with pessimism as a formula for depression. Living in the past. Or sometimes we live in the future. Or things will be great once I'm out of high school and I get into college and get a job. And, uh, and then once I, oh, once I get married, I mean, that's, that's when. But once, once we have kids, then, then life will be great. Once, once they get into school, you know, so that I have, so we have some time to ourselves. Once, once they're out of the house, eight, 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 once, once we're retired, then, then we can start to live. And it's a whole series of waiting for the right time to live. And a whole series of todays pass you by and you weren't even there because you were waiting for tomorrow. All we have is what's today. That's all we have. Where are you today? Are you here? Because that's where the relationships are and that's where the lessons in life are. We all learn different things. Different lessons in life. This is something I learned. Somebody else may have learned this. Has anybody here ever learned that if you put garlic bread under the broiler, if you leave it in too long, you can burn it. Anybody ever done that? We all learn different things. Uh, let me give you a tip that you may not have learned. 
if you burn it bad enough, it will catch on fire. <laughs> now I can't even get my logs to burn, but garlic bread... And it's not a fluke because it's happened more than once. <laughs> it does. All pieces were just on fire, just, just flaming. We learn different things in life. I, w I came to a stop, a red stoplight, and I was waiting for the light to turn green. And I was sitting there, and I was sort of daydreaming. You know how it is, the car next to you starts to go? So I started to go, and I looked up, and it was still red. The car next to me had a left turn arrow. Has that ever happened to you? That's, that's easy to happen. So I, I slammed on my brakes. No harm done. I didn't go into the intersection. But the person behind me <laughs> saw that I was going. So. so he started to go, and of course, he wasn't expecting me to slam on my brakes. And he plowed into the back of my car. I got a big dent in the back of my car. I thought, well... There must be a lesson here someplace. And the person that I was following going that way was going the right way for him. But that's not necessarily the right way for me. I mean, that's just like real life, isn't it? And the guy behind me, he was following someone who thought he knew where he was going. And he didn't. And that's just like real life. All kinds of lessons in life and a little bit of humor and you'll laugh afterwards. You've heard the saying, sometime we'll laugh about this. I left Missouri. I left at the back gate of an Air Force base. They briefed us. Thunderstorms and flash flooding that night. We saw three tornado funnels that night going out to a missile silo for an underground alert assignment of 48 hours. Three tornadoes. We left the back gate. Normally when a crew goes out, you've got the commander, I was the commander, I had a deputy who was junior to me. Normally the deputy always drives the car, I get car sick, so my job is to drive the car. And we got to the gate, it was raining, cats and dogs, and the gate was locked to the padlock, so we turned the headlights on, and we had to get out and undo the padlock, and open the gate, and drive the truck through, and close the gate, and lock the padlock, and get back in the truck, dripping wet. That was my deputy's job. <laughs> And we headed on down this back road, isolated because it only went to the back gate of the base, which was closed, so nobody used that road. And sure enough, we drove into a section of flash flooding and we stalled the engine and I shut it off and couldn't even see the road up ahead. And my deputy looked at me and he said, I think the engine's flooded? And I thought, boy, I wish I was back in the cockpit. At least uh, the seat cushions would be usable for flotation. But the Air Force had prepared us, we were armed. We could shoot our way out. <laughs> I had a theory that if I waited for about 10 minutes, I could turn the engine back on. The heat of the engine would evaporate the water and it would start. That was my theory, and I waited about we just sat there. 10 minutes. And I turned the engine, turned the ignition, and it started. And I turned on the headlights, and about 75 feet ahead, I could see the road coming out of the water. And we just inched our way toward that road. Boy, I was present. You know, Robert Schuller says, yard by yard, life is hard, inch by inch is less. And what we need in life sometimes is the vision, the headlights, to see our goal. If we got storm around us, we need to see where we're headed in order to get there. Little lessons in life all the time. We headed on. Further on down, we came to another section of flash flooded road I was expecting at this time. I didn't drive into it right away. I noticed far down at the other end, there appeared to be another set of headlights. And I watched them, and the headlights would go out and on. And the other headlight would go out and on. Out and on. The headlight would go out and on. They were both, they were alternating, out and on. And it appeared to be getting closer and closer. And I said, I think that the next car is coming our direction. And if we drive into the water and head toward it, I think they'll show us where the road is. And we'll pass them and come out on the other end. So we started heading into the water, driving nice and slowly to make sure it wasn't too deep. We got closer, we got closer. And then I realized what it was. It was, a, it was another car coming. 
and someone was walking in front of the car clearing branches off the road back and forth in front of the head wow a lesson sometimes the light at the end of the tunnel is just the headlight for somebody else in trouble yeah. and, and, just, and just like in real life sometimes if somebody else is in trouble that helps us get through a tough situation tough times at work where you stick together, you're implementing a new plan and you stick together and you hold hands and you get through to the other end. And sure enough, we made it through to the other end. We made it to our destination that night. A trip that normally took an hour and a half took us four and a half hours that night. It was a long trip when we got there, but you know, the, the exciting thing wasn't really getting there. Just like in life, the excitement isn't arriving at the destination, at the return. The excitement is in the journey. Everything is in the present moment and where we are right now. That's where it all is. And the question is, where are you right now? The choices we make. Anybody here ever worry? Two things can happen if you worry. Number one, what you worry about doesn't happen. And number two, what you worry about happens. For that, you came here tonight. Take, for example, something you're worrying about happens. You suffer twice. You suffer when it happens, and you suffer in advance. I call worrying practice suffering. Now, if you're not good at suffering, I recommend that you worry a lot so that you get some practice. So that when the calamity comes, you're good at suffering. Or if it never happens, and research shows that most of the things we worry about never happen, then we only suffer once. Unnecessary. Oh, what a deal. The interesting thing is, the flip side of worry is goal setting. Think about it. When you're worrying, you're focusing on the things you don't want to happen, or you don't want to be, the negative side, the negative side of life. Goal setting, you're focusing on the things you want to happen, where you want to be, the positive things in life. It's the exact opposite. If you find yourself falling in the worry trap, if you're goal directed, it's goals that give us energy. A project at work, redoing the files, cleaning out a garage, it feels so good to it's done. Goals and the achievement and getting things done. So if you're falling in the worry trap, consider the flip side to it. Let me share a story with you about a, a young man that uh, taught me several lessons in life. His name is Matt. I'm going to introduce Matt to you. This is that's Matt. 17 years old. Matt, Matt's grandmother is Connie, and she used to be my marketing director. So I got to know Matt, and he used to spend time over at my house. He helped me paint the house. He went on vacation with me. He went to Las Vegas. He went to the Magic Castle. He went to a convention with me of professional speakers. Matt was one of those teenagers that had challenges, and things weren't quite working out at home, so he moved in with his grandparents. Never heard from his dad, hardly. His dad never sent cards on his birthday. But in spite of all that, he had a lot of things going for him. He lived with two grandparents who really loved him. His mom cared about him a lot as well, even though they weren't living together. He was six foot two, built like a bodybuilder on the football team. His girlfriend was the president of the student body. He had a lot of things going for him as well. Matt used to like to have a lot of fun. And he... Went to a convention with me. And he was with a small group of 10 kids. He was in the youth conference. There were 1,500 professional speakers in the room. And they had to get up, their group of 10, had to get up and do a skit for 1,500 professional speakers. And they had designed their own skit. They were on a bus ride. Bus driver in the front. All the kids lined up, chairs, two by two, little girl in the back seat with big girls, and they were on a bus ride, and they were going like this. The little girl raised her hand, she says, I gotta go wee, I gotta go wee. And the bus driver says, just a second, just ten minutes, we'll be there, ten minutes. Says, I gotta go wee, I gotta go wee right now. Just, it won't be much longer, just, just hold it. I gotta go wee right now. The bus driver says, all right, man stopped the bus and he got off the bus and one by one each of the kids got off 
And the little girl with the last one, and she got off the bus, and she went, brought the house down just like kids to have a little bit of message sometimes in life it's tedious or it's boring and we just gotta go and maybe even be silly sometimes yeah Matt always taught me that the importance of having fun in life he went out with some friends one weekend they hopped in a pickup truck and they went out south of town and they were on a country road gravel road and they lost control of the truck they were having a little too much fun I suspect going a little bit too fast they rolled the truck and Matt was thrown from the truck and four hours later in the emergency room Matt died oh, you never know what's around the corner do you? for any of us you never know the sister-in-law wrote a poem I'm going to share that with you it's called Matt Football pendants on the walls, boyish laughter down these halls, lifting weights, making dates. You thought you'd live forever, didn't you? Three boys set out on a weekend late in a pickup truck, tempting fate, filled with joy. Just three boys. You thought you'd live forever, didn't you? Police sirens fill the night as they come upon a terrible sight. Mangled boys, crushed toys. The thought you'd live forever, didn't you? An aftermath filled with pain, sobbing families, laying blame. So young, so, so young. We thought you'd live forever, too. You never know what's around the corner. I share this story with you for three reasons. Three things that I learned from that that I want to share with you. Number one. You never know what's around the corner. You never know how important someone is until they're gone. And the question, the question is today, is there somebody you need to call? Is there somebody at work you need to give a kind word to or give a hug to? Where are we today? That's what really counts. Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. Number two, I learned the importance of expressing your feelings to people. I'd always wanted to tell Matt that I loved him. But, uh, you know, men don't share feelings like that oftentimes. And, but I did, you know, I'm glad that I did. And I remember the day I told him, I said, Matt, I, I love you, Matt. And he says, I love you too. I love you too. And he gave me a big hug. I thought, wow, even 17 year old football players need hugs and love just like everybody else in the world. So important. Number three, Matt showed me about having fun and the importance of having fun. On one of my trips, one of my business trips, I had my props in the car and he used to like to drive my car because he had just gotten his driver's license. I had him in phone with me. We stopped by a fast food restaurant and he rolled down the window. We were around the corner where they couldn't see us. Welcome to, there we go. Welcome to Burger City. May I take your order, please? I'm sorry, could you please repeat that? We just had some fun with it. It's great, with a little bit of play and having just a little bit of fun. Learned a lot from that. And really the important thing that I learned was what's important today. Where am I today? Where are the maths in my life today? That's what really matters appreciating the joys and the things of the past that I've had. I saw an interview on the radio not too long ago, and someone was being interviewed, and they said, you know, my daughter came up to me and she said, Daddy, Daddy, would you help me put a puzzle together? And he said, not now, I'm busy, I'm working on a project, we'll do it later. And then he thought to himself, he said, he said, gee, you know, if this were the last chance I would ever have to put a puzzle together with my daughter, would I do it? And I thought, isn't that an interesting question? I thought, what if you're at home and your significant other says, Hey, honey, let's go out for a walk. And you say, I'm crazy, it's raining out there. Instead, you ask yourself the question, If this were the last chance I would ever have to take a walk in the rain with the person I love, would I do it? 
Doesn't that change the answer a lot? Or take the flip side of that, the real flip side, and you're sitting there and you're getting ready to relax in your couch at night and you, uh, you ask yourself, if this were the last chance in the world I would ever have to watch Wheel of Fortune, <laughs> would I do it? Is it possible there'd be a better thing to do with your life? What a great question. Isn't that wonderful? And it's a way of shaping some of your priorities and what you're doing in life. It's always a choice. It's like a fellow who lived in a senior high rise and he came down from the 19th floor for breakfast. He was going through the breakfast line. Tiny little glasses of orange juice. The sign says orange juice. Take only one. God is watching. <laughs> he didn't see anybody, but he's a good guy. He follows the rules. He takes one, puts it on his tray. He goes on down the line. Comes the scrambled eggs. Big stainless steel tray, they call them scramblers. No sign. I'll make my own sign. Took out a sheet of paper. Made a sign. Put it down. Scramblers, take all you want. God's watching the orange juice. <laughs> he knew when he came to the first sign he had a choice. Do you see how he might have been upset at the first sign? Give me a break. Instead, he chose to look at the light side. Made himself feel better probably than how about the 15, 20 people that came behind him. He shared his humor with the people around him. And that's something that we can always do. I like sharing magic with people and I like using magic as a metaphor in my life. Because life is just like magic, isn't it? Like magic, there are things in life we'll never understand. Teenagers sometimes. And teenagers think adults sometimes. Like magic, there are some things in life that aren't what they appear to be. Politicians. There are some things in life that appear to be magic and maybe really are miracles and we just need to sit back and enjoy and really appreciate them. There are things in life that appear to be magic and we create them in our own minds. Our own fun, energy, enthusiasm. We create our own love and our own laughter. Just like, just like magic. Just like we have a magic wand. And I'd ask you to remember that as you sit and as you watch the magic of life parade in front of you, to always remember you are not the audience. You are the magician. You have a wand. You can wave it. Create your fun. Create your enthusiasm. You can go wee anytime you want. And you know what? You gotta look for the fun in life and you gotta enjoy it because it's your job. It's your job. Thank you for coming tonight. I've enjoyed sharing my message. Thank you.